and in this video we'll be looking at security protocols. Um, so as you can see in this slide, we're using the network layer um, to capture uh, where security protocols falls in. And basically, in every layer, we can see some sort of security protocols embedded. With. So um, let's have a look at the application layer. Which security protocols do you think uh, falls into the application layer? Okay. So if you, you should be familiar with uh, things like HTTPS, um, but there are some other protocols like Kerberos, PGP, and SHTTP. Okay. And in the transport layer, we have some more familiar names like SSL and TLS. Uh, also at the internet layer, we have items like VPN and IPsec. And finally, at the network access layer, we have items like PPP, various, and PPTP. Of course, there are a lot more other security protocols that falls into these layers, but um, I'm just showing you a few of the popular ones uh, that gets used. Okay, so in particular, we'll be looking at a few of them uh, as follows. Okay, so let's get started from the application layer. So in the previous slide, we've seen um, SHTTP and HTTPS. Well, are they the same thing? We can have a quick look right now. So if you had a quick look, um, the answer is should be no. Well, let's have a look what SHTTP is. Okay. So SHTTP, um, it stands for Secure HTTP. Okay. And this has been built on top of HTTP. So it's kind of like, hey, we built this and we're adding that additional security on top of what we built already. And often you will find that uh, sometimes it doesn't work really well. And that's what happened in this case. Um, basically what SHTTP does is it encrypts the message of HTTP only. So it doesn't really provide any security against attacks uh, on the communication channel. Okay. Um, also, it doesn't support server-only authentication. Um, this is handy because sometimes from a server, you don't really want to uh, authenticate every single client. You don't, maybe you don't really worry about it. Like you're like a shopping mall site and as long as the payments are cleared, then you don't really have to worry about who purchased um, items or not. But from the user's perspective, uh, authenticating the server is really important because that's your service provider. So for various reasons like these, um, it doesn't really get used anymore. And basically people have migrated to use HTTPS. Okay. Um, so you'll see those um, lock signs um, in your browsers when you're using HTTPS uh, with a green lock. And when you don't use it, sometimes like an orange lock with unclipped or like a red um, signs or lock sign with a cross. Basically it means um, your traffic um, the message in the HTTPS and the communication is protected using SSL. Okay, and what HTTPS does is it relies on um, security provided through uh, SSL, and so the whole communication uh, through HTTPS is wrapped around SSL. Um, and you can easily um, notice uh, with the URL that starts with HTTPS. Okay? Um, and most of the servers and traffic is moving towards um, HTTPS now due to um, security reasons uh, with HTTP. Basically, HTTP is a clear text. So whenever you are entering sensitive information, make sure that um, it's encrypted through HTTPS. So to better understand HTTPS, we need to look at SSL. So we're kind of jumping the layers here. And SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer, typically used in port 443. So HTTP is port 80, HTTPS is 443. So we see a lot more uh, traffic uh, going through this particular port now. Okay. Um, the security mechanism of HTTPS is really relying on SSL, hence uh, we will look at SSL uh, in more detail. Okay. Um, 
not only HTTPS, but there are some other applications that also rely on SSL, such as SSMTP and SPOP3. Okay? And what SSL provides is, um, in addition to encryption, it can also uh, provide authentication. And this authentication can be one way, either authenticating only the server, or two ways. It can also authenticate um, server and client at the same time. So let's have a look how that gets done. Okay. So to establish SSL, uh, we need to do some handshake. Okay. So first, what happens is client sends its hello message, and this hello message contains a bunch of information. Uh, we'll, be having, we'll look at those um, items soon, but basically it's to establish the details between the two. Okay. And in addition to that, we need to verify the server. So this must be done, and therefore the server has to send uh, the server certificate. And if you want to uh, authenticate the user as well, the user can also um, the server can request the user about uh, the client's uh, certificate as well. Okay. So once this is done, uh, the client will provide some additional information to the server to establish the secure connection. Okay. And of course, in addition to that, uh, the client can provide a um, client certificate uh, as well as send for a certificate verification uh, of the server. Okay? And once this is done, through your handshake, you can start to communicate um, in secure fashion. Okay? So let's have a look at what kind of uh, information that needs to be sent around. So in the, um, the hello messages, what client first do is it uh, tells the server about um, the SSL and TLS uh, versions. So these are the supported um, SSL operations I can do that specifies those. In addition to that, it's going to uh, tell the server about what kind of uh, encryption uh, algorithms it can use, uh, um, how to do the key exchange, what kind of ciphers uh, it supports, um, what kind of MAC algorithm it uses, uh, and so forth. So all those details uh, with the priority being in the top get sent to uh, the server. And what the server hello replies is it contains um, the selection of um, those items like okay I'm going to use RSA for key exchange, I'm going to use AES for the cipher suits, I'm going to use the HMAC SH1 for uh, MAC algorithm etc. Okay? So server hello contains all those items. Okay? In addition to those uh, items, server will also send its certificate. And uh, what certificates do is um, it, they are provided by a third party called certificate authority. And certificate authorities are trusted parties in the network that um, the clients and servers can check uh, the validity of um, whether they are uh, actually that client or that server they claim to be. Okay, so uh, places like VeriSign provides these kind of services, okay, and it specifies like the dates and serial numbers and the public key of the places, uh, etc. So this means um, that if an attacker comes along and try to forge the certificate, um, they need to uh, match the identity that's stored by the VeriSign and that uh, from our uh, cryptography lectures is um, practically impossible to do. Okay, if that mean, uh, to do that, that means you need to know the private key. Alternatively, you can take over the very sign, but that's probably even harder. Anyway, so server will send a certificate and client uh, using the certificate, um, certificate can also contain the public key, like the RSA. So if RSA is enabled, um, you don't really specify the key exchange. Uh, so that key exchange bullet point means just sending it over. Okay. So at this stage, client will generate a session key. Okay. So this session key is um, like a, a pre-master key. Okay. So this is the common key that the client and server will use to generate the, uh, that uh, symmetric key to use for the cipher suit. Okay? Uh, so the client will uh, encrypt this session key using the server's public key, and then the key gets sent over to um, the server. Okay? 
So the solver can use that uh, session key uh, with um, this random number for the symmetric key generation. Uh, use that to uh, generate the shared secret key. Okay. Um, in addition to that, the client can also validate uh, the server's identity. You can check it through um, the client uh, certificate authority that client can confirm the identity of the server. And at this point, once the client checks out the server's identity and sent all the information needed, the handshake finishes for the client. Okay? So at this point, what the client do is it's going to start encrypting its message using the generated shared secret key uh, to, uh, to the server. Okay. And uh, from the server side, it's just going to update the Cypher specification using the received pre-master key, the session key, generate the shared secret key, and once the data is uh, start coming over from the client, uh, it can decrypt. Okay. So server and client can also agree to validate that uh, the shared secret key is working. Um, as an additional step, but obviously that's an optional thing to do. Okay, um, if everything goes well, so this uh, steps have taken, and uh, both client and server are happy with um, uh, the steps, then the communication begins. However, there are some times where the communication can be terminated, and those are when the validation fails. For instance, a client could not confirm the identity. Uh, the authenticity of the uh, certificate provided by the server. That means the server may be masquerading as uh, the legitimate server, but may not. Uh, messages out of order, so if the sync gets out of order, then they can terminate SSL as well, so they need to restart. And invalid message in the communication. So if anything goes wrong in, in between the communications, um, then it will shut down. All right, so hopefully that SSL handshake is pretty clear. It's kind of similar to TLS, uh, no, TCP three-way handshake, but you see much more additional information gets uh, added to that. So the SSL architecture, uh, it does provide um, the whole suite of uh, services, like how to do the handshake, um, how to change the cipher, uh, alerts, applications, uh, records, okay? And basically, this SSL record protocol supports all those uh, functionalities uh, of the SSL. Okay. So what does the uh, SSL record protocol do is uh, it focuses on the two services. Okay. So we mentioned that uh, SSL provides um, encryption and authentication, and that uh, falls into these two services. Uh, firstly, the message integrity uh, using MAC, uh, which is a message authentication code. Um, has a bunch of different hash functions. So when the client sent over what kind of MAC algorithm do you want to use, this is a uh, part where uh, it ticks off which one they want to use. Okay, And also the cipher suits get sent over and the message confidentiality service will select which um, cipher suit uh, to be used uh, among the two. Okay, So we're going to have a look at uh, MAC procedure. Okay. So what MAC does is just validate the authenticity of the message and authentic authenticity of the message only. Okay. So it does not provide um, any authentication of the identity, hence uh, MAC cannot be used as a digital signature. Okay. Uh, but the process is pretty simple. Let's have a look how it's looked like. Okay. So sender sends the message, right? But uh, also it's going to chuck into the MAC algorithm that both agreed, okay? Uh, typically it will have a key. Um, however, there are non-key version as well. Um, so message into the algorithm, it will generate a MAC value, okay? So as a sender, you will send both the message and MAC, okay? So if this message gets intercepted by an attacker, say a man in the middle attack, uh, modifies the message and gets forward to the receiver, the receiver can uh, put the message into the MAC algorithm that they agreed and calculate its own MAC to compare it with the received MAC. If they're equal, that means the integrity of the message is true. However, if something uh, has been changed, this MAC algorithm uh, will significantly uh, be different. So that's why a lot of hashing algorithm gets used as part of the MAC algorithm. Okay. Hopefully that was pretty simple. 
All right. So some quiz time. This is uh, where you can post some videos and try to answer. Um, I will go over a few examples, but um, obviously it's not going to be an exhaustive list of solutions. So, uh, there may be some others uh, that you can apply as well. So if yours differs to mine, um, don't panic. You can always check with me. So firstly, can SSL mitigate man the middle attack? Okay, so hopefully you had a pause and um, had a go. Uh, well, basically, man the middle attack on SSL are really only possible if uh, one of SSL's preconditions is broken. Okay, so what are the preconditions that SSL have? Well, firstly, um, the server key, supposed to be the, the private key, should be kept secret, but that has been leaked. Okay, that means uh, the attacker can masquerade as the server because it has its private key. Okay? That's left one scenario. Another one is the client trusts an untrustworthy uh, certificate authority, the CA that produced the um, digital signature of the server. Okay, so if we have a if we have the client uh, Certificate authority that acts malicious, obviously um, that's going to impact how the certificates can be generated and as well as uh, maliciously being used. Okay. Alternatively, we also have the uh, client who does not bother to validate uh, the certificate uh, correctly. Okay. So just um, randomly checking. A uh, few details, just looking at the cipher suits and some algorithms without really properly checking out uh, who has issued the certificate and validating that through the CA services um, that can um, uh, cause an issue here because the server uh, may not be legitimate um, and using some really um, not trustworthy certificate but if the client doesn't check that, obviously um, the server can start behaving maliciously. Okay? And another option is that um, the client itself can be compromised, but obviously this is now not really related to a man in the middle, but rather the client getting hacked. Okay? So what type of attacks does SSL prevent and mitigate? Well, we just have to check out what services they provided, right? So it provides uh, confidentiality and integrity of the communication. Okay, so things like um, sniffing attack can be mitigated. Uh, people trying to hijack your um, connections can be mitigated. People trying to um, uh, forge uh, Information being transferred, the, the messages can be mitigated and so forth. So a lot of uh, different attacks that tries to violate integrity and confidentiality can be mitigated here. Okay. What happens when SSL uses a flawed crypto system? Okay, so this is kind of like a... Um, Trick question, right? So the focus is on the flawed crypto system. That means your crypto algorithm uh, or the cipher um, algorithm is um, prone to some attack. Uh, that means SSL itself, the procedure, um, should still provide uh, CI. However, because the crypto system is flawed, uh, attacker can do some crypto analysis and a launch attack against that. So the whole um, protocol becomes kind of meaningless uh, and the attacker may be able to get a uh, plain text as well as um, secret key they're using. Anyway, so that's uh, some uh, few questions we went over. Moving on, IPsec. Okay. Um, what we will do in this video is not really go over in detail about IPsec because um, the implementation is just utilizing like tools and commands, uh, but I want to capture uh, the high-level overview about exactly what IPsec provides. Okay? So 
Uh, back in the days, uh, there was no data integrity or confidentiality implemented at the IP level. Okay, so when you think about IPv4, it literally had no security. Um, so that is due to the design that's applicable to small networks. So in those small networks, people trusted each other. However, that was still used for our large network where it connects billions of users. And obviously, it's not a way to go. Okay, so we've got a bunch of attacks that can be happening. So IPsec aims to provide confidentiality and or integrity of network packets. Okay, uh, That's an and or because depending on which mode you uh, select. Okay, So through confidentiality, we can enable data encryption to achieve that and integrity by enabling hash functions, just like um, SSL we've seen before. So you can kind of see uh, the, uh, the method you use to achieve CIA um, is quite straightforward. Okay. Uh, also, to verify the sources of packets using authentication, okay, and prevent replay attacks, uh, packets using sequence numbers. So, let's have a look at some IPsec uh, modes. So, IPsec modes we have two: either transport mode or tunnel mode. Okay, and let's have a look at their differences. What does the tunnel mode do? Basically, um, what it does is IPsec datagram uh, emitted and received by end systems. Okay, so this is a connection between host to host. Okay, so this is where we will say it's a transport mode. Okay, uh, it protects upper level protocols. Okay, upper level protocols um, can be secured through IPsec. So that's including the, the transport layer and the uh, 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 application layer. Okay, um, in tunnel mode instead, um, this is the N routers uh, IPsec capable. Okay, so those routers allow you to enable IPsec uh, as a tunnel mode. Okay, most commonly used between gateways or from end end station to a gateway. So typically, whenever whenever you enable IPsec, um, depends on where you're connecting to. Uh, it's a different mode of communication. Okay, so in our original IP packet, we have the IP header and the rest of the packet, which is the pay payload. Um, when we enable the transport mode, basically what happens is we are adding additional layer, uh, which is IPsec header. Okay. However, if we are using the tunnel mode, it's totally different. We have the new IPsec header on top of everything else, and then we have the IPsec header and the IP header. Okay, so we we'll look at those differences um, shortly. And basically, once you chose a mode to use, uh, and that's really uh, constrained by your physical connections, uh, you can choose the uh, the protocol to use. Okay, you either have the authentication header protocol or encapsulating security payload. Okay, so. Uh, AH or ESP. So the two protocols um, vary slightly. Basically, the authentication header protocol, the AH protocol, uh, it provides authentication, as it says, um, and data integrity. So the integrity of the data cannot be changed, but it does not provide confidentiality. That means it does not uh, apply any encryptions or anything into the payload, which means uh, you are relying on other layers to take care of that. Okay, whereas in the um, ESP uh, protocol, it provides um, uh, the data origin authentication, integrity, and confidentiality. So it does provide that um, encryption uh, to the payload. However, there is no IP header authentication. This means your IP header is still prone uh, to attack. Okay, so. You can see they both have some pros and cons, and depending on the scenario that you are up against, um, they will be used in different ways. So let's have a look at it uh, through pictures. Basically, um, the AH protocol provides source authentication and data integrity. Okay? Um, so in the transport mode, well, what's going to happen is in the IPsec AH header, it's going to include a, the authenticated um, well, authentication 
value uh, in there. Okay, uh, there are some mutable fields, for example, where these authentication values uh, can be uh, included uh, is excluded. Okay, so all the other fields can be chucked into a part of the um, authentication uh, method and produce that, and uh, this result will go in there. Okay, so uh, when somebody attacks this packet, basically, if you modify like the IP header or the data, obviously it can be caught easily. And if you modify this authenticated value in the mutual fields, uh, mutable fields, obviously that's going to check it up. So that's not going to check up at the receiver's end. So you can't really change anything. So this provides the authentication. Same with the tunnel mode. Basically, um, it's going to provide authentication for the whole length of the packet. And that there's going to be some fields in the new IP header uh, that includes um, these um, authentication values, and that's going to be sent over. Okay, but do note that because it doesn't provide the confidentiality, things are here okay, it will be uh, in clear text. So uh, as an attacker, you can see um, who's sending what to whoever the receiver is. Okay. Um, uh, fortunately, the data fields, we will rely on higher layers uh, to encrypt them. However, if you don't, then obviously this data will also be uh, in clear text, right? Okay, so um, what do they include in those fields? Well, in the new IP header, if you are in that um, tunnel mode, uh, it's going to have the IP header information, uh, next header pointing to the AH IP header information, and may also include some payload length. But this IP header means um, because it's in a tunnel mode, it hides the host information. So the host information will be inside that IP, original IP header. So new IP header will include um, the IP information about um, the routers. And therefore, from the attacker's perspective, you can't really pinpoint who the host is. Okay? And inside the AH um, header field is going to have the security parameter index as well as the sequence number to pro provide, make sure things uh, arrive in order. Um, and the IP header, it includes the uh, original IP header information, but some other things like uh, initial vectors and so forth. And data fields will include the data payload. So let's have a look at the ESP mode and how it differs to the ESP protocol and how it differs to the AH protocol. So it does provide some authentication with integrity and in addition confidentiality. Okay. So what happens is the data fields uh, in addition to the padding, depending on the encryption, uh, will be encrypted. So this part, if your higher um, application does not provide encryption, uh, this is where uh, this can come in handy. And in addition to this, it will provide authentication to these fields. It doesn't include the IP header, uh, however. Okay? And then uh, this authentication value will be attached at, at the end of this packet. So your packet will grow a little bit. In the tunnel mode, similar thing happens. Um, you will be encrypting um, anything after the ESP IPsec. And uh, including the ESP um, IPsec header, it's going to be authenticated and the authenticated uh, value will be stored at the end. Okay? As you can see here again, uh, the very header uh, in, in terms of, in case of transport mode, IP header, and in case of the tunnel mode, the new IP header, it doesn't get encrypted nor authenticated. Okay? So um, these are the informations. Um, Pretty much the new items compared to the age are the, the paddings and also the authentication. But hopefully those descriptions should explain clearly um, that the straightforward items. Okay. So what's the difference between the two? Well, in tunnel mode, the AH protocol does provide authentication for the whole thing. And also it doesn't need that additional um, length to add the paddings and the authentication payload. Okay, the authentication payload goes straight into the AH header. Um, however, it does not provide encryption of the data and the IP header uh, 
that the ESP protocol provides. Okay, so those are the the key um, differences between uh, those two in the tunnel mode. Okay. Um, similarly, if you apply this in the um, transport mode, a similar difference will be observed. Okay. So, in summary of the IPsec, um, IPsec provides transparent security. Um, high layers do not need to be aware of the security at the low layer because um, all of this gets handled at the low layer of the network layers. Okay, so higher layers, when they receive whatever they're supposed to receive, uh, will be arriving as it's supposed to be. So it's kind of like a um, delivery um, uh, services provided by the networks, right? Uh, however, uh, it is a host to host or gateway to gateway security, uh, not aware of uh, user applications. Therefore, it may interfere with uh, application requirements and um, it may not meet, uh, for example, the quality of service that the network needs to provide. Okay? IPsec packets need to be ordered, uh, where IP is designed not to worry about the order of dropped packets. Okay? Um, so this does kind of act slightly counterintuitive uh, with the design of the IP. However, uh, in practice, um, it works uh, reasonably well. Um, because there's uh, other ways to line up the packets and orders and so forth. Okay, and in addition to this, we're going to uh, use this one slide to go over the VPN. Um, it's a very super short overview of VPN. Basically, it's a virtual private network. And uh, in a nutshell, it's the implementation of um, ESP protocol using the IPsec uh, to implement VPN. Okay. Uh, packets go from internal network to a gateway with the TCP IP and then the entire packet uh, gets hidden uh, using the encryption. Okay. This includes the original header so the destination addresses are hidden. So from a network goes to the gateway, it gets encrypted uh, using the ESP protocol, it gets sent over. Okay. So that means if I snoop it, I only know the sources from this gateway. I can't, I can't unpack and see where exactly it's going to. Okay? So the receiving gateway decrypts the information and send it to the appropriate um, destination. Okay? And this is known as the VPN tunnel. So uh, the implementation of VPN um, can be uh, overlapping with IPsec. Okay? Anyway. So that brings us to the conclusion of the protocol summary. Um, security protocols are implemented in different layers of the system, very complex due to building on top of the existing models that did not consider security from the beginning. However, we are transiting away from that. Uh, a lot of uh, um, devices nowadays support IPv6. However, still a lot of um, networking infrastructure that we built on uh, uh, in the past few decades uh, do not support IPv6. Therefore, slowly they're getting replaced, um, but eventually we'll move away from there. And hopefully we don't have these um, issues anymore. Um, yeah. So we do have lots of different protocols to enhance the security. Um, basically, depending on the requirement, uh, we should be able to choose the protocol from different layers carefully to satisfy the security requirements of the system. Anyway, so that should conclude this particular video, otherwise I'll see you in the next one, bye!